we're still stuck in the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands is in its uh, second wave uh, with the coronavirus, which means that uh, Madagascar is not allowing us to come back. But in the meanwhile, um, I just um, wanted to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about my, my story. How did I become Christian? Um, well, basically, this goes already a long while ago. Um, when I was about 16 years old, I um, started to work in a bakery. And uh, my boss, he was, he was a Christian, and I wasn't. Actually, I loved to go to, to house parties, uh, rave parties, drink a lot, of, a lot of alcohol, hang out with girls, do a lot of fighting and stuff like that. Still, I don't know why he accepted me in, um, in his bakery and uh, I started to work there as a, as a full-time bread baker. Every Monday, he um, wanted to talk with me about um, the things he was doing on the Sunday morning in church or on the Sunday evening or Monday evening on Bible study or prayer meetings. And I basically told him about my experiences in, on, the, on the parties and um, things like that. It kind of annoyed me that he um, wanted to talk about God all the time. Um, it irritated me and I basically thought that he was a kind of a wimp. You know, those losers who need a God to, to feel uh, secu secure. And I didn't need God, did I? But after a while, I, I said to him, well, you know what? We kind of discuss this topic uh, all the time. Um, I tell you what, if you can prove the Bible is true, I would like to, I, I will become a Christian. <laughs> It, it was actually a way of, of trying to get rid of all the conversations. But, um, yeah, I was a bit shocked because he said, okay, I, I, I will accept this challenge and um, I will prove to you that the Bible is actually, actually correct and accurate. So the week after, I came back on my, um, in the bakery, it was very early in the morning, about 2.30 in the morning, and he said to me, you can go to the kitchen and, and sit down and drink some coffee and have some biscuits. And uh, I've got some books there for you to read. And when I came in the kitchen, I, I saw all these books and they were your ordinary history books that you can find in the library on school as well. And he pointed some pages out which I had to read. And I didn't really know what he was trying to do, but all these pages were about um, the history of Israel and the, the Jewish people. And I didn't have a clue what they had to do with the Bible. I mean, I didn't have any knowledge of the Bible back then. So what about this Israel? What, what is it? So anyway, after, after reading through all these facts of history, uh, not only 1948 when Israel became a state again, but also the, 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 the history before that time, I came back in the bakery and I told him, um, like, uh, you didn't prove anything with that. I mean, that was just history. What, what, what do you think to, to do now? And he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm not finished yet. Just give me a chance. And so I waited for a few more days. I think it was the, the week after. He invited me into the kitchen again. Again, with coffee and biscuits and biscuits and pastry. I love that. I mean, I still love that. And I was sitting there and in front of me um, was his Bible. And he explained to me how to, to search things um, up in the Bible, like uh, Bible verses, uh, chapters, because I didn't know anything about it. And he said, I want you to read this and that and that. So I started to read and it took me a long time because it was a, a, a very... Uh, yeah, the, the old language, the King James uh, version of the, the Dutch Bible, if you like. Anyway, after a while, um, I noticed that all the chapters I had to read uh, were actually chapters in which a prophet, you know, the, the, the guys with the long beards and the gray hair, um, were foretelling things about the future around the, the people of Israel. 
about the Jewish people. And I was absolutely astonished because, I mean, they already foretold things that, that, that um, only happened hundreds of years later. So I was a bit, bit, a bit shocked about that. But I, I remembered my promise. I said, if, if you prove that the Bible is accurate, I will become a Christian. And I, I, I didn't really want to become one. So I went back into the bakery and I told him, you know what, if you, you, you said that the Bible is true and I, I kind of believe you, but if the Bible is true, then it's also true that the non-believers will go to hell. And I didn't have a clue what hell was about, but I've heard about fire and stuff and pain and things like that. And I was also thinking about the, the, the people, they say that in Holland, and I will translate, uh, maybe you've got something similar in English, but in Holland sometimes they say, um, in heaven there is no beer, so that's why we drink it here. And I was thinking about heaven as a dull place, a place where you cannot have any fun. So I told him, I'm a bread baker, I love the heat, just let me go to hell and I will enjoy myself there which was a kind of a dumb thing to say. I said it anyway. And I felt bad about it because he stopped talking about his faith with me. I think I disappointed him. It, it took weeks, I think even several months before something happened and the conversation started again. The thing that happened was that I was emptying the, the oven and I was in a kind of a hurry. So I, I tried to grab um, something out of the oven and I burned my arm and the thing is that um, with an oven of 250 degrees Celsius your skin is coming off so that was really really painful and um, instead of helping me he started to to laugh and I was furious I said why are you laughing about this this is not a joke come on and he said hold on a minute weren't you the one who said let me go to hell because I love the pain and that, like, that was like, like a bomb. It exploded and in my face. And I was going like, oh, wow, I really said that. So that evening, I was terrified. Again, I didn't really know what hell was about, but I was terrified. And um, sometimes you have these little tiles on the wall with a picture on it. And I know one with a little girl who was kneeling down and folding her hands and praying. And I thought, okay, that's the way to, to do it. So I did the same. And I said, Lord God, you may save me now, but don't you think I'm going to change my life um, in, in your direction? But you may save me. So that was my prayer. It was pretty awkward, pretty um, blunt, if you ask me now. But anyway, I did it. And I didn't feel anything. I thought you have to feel something or something coming down from the sky I don't know so the next day I told my boss that I prayed this and but didn't feel anything and he said so you think um, God didn't hear you I said no I don't think he likes me too much and he and my boss started to laugh and he said you know what God has seen worse people than that in history I, I think he can deal with it so anyway I after many so many years now I I I, I look back and I see, yeah, God, God really dealt with it. That's, that's true. He started to change my life uh, nonetheless. Um, I started to feel uh, more uh, compassionate about other people. For, uh, for instance, one time I was getting into a fight with uh, a young man uh, in the pub and I told him to, to come with me outside and I would teach him a lesson. Um, and when we were standing outside the pub, um, I looked into his eyes and I was going like, oh, no, I, c I can't do this. I c this. This is not right. And another time I went to the pub and I started to drink beer again too much. Oh, no, that's what I wanted. I wanted to drink too much. And uh, after the second beer, I, I didn't feel like drinking another one. I just, I don't know. I just didn't feel like it. And things like that started to change little by little. After a while, I noticed it and it got it made me furious I, I, and I went to my room again and I started to pray and I said, Lord, this is, I didn't even say Lord, I said, God, this is not what I want. This is not what we um, agreed on. And I don't, I don't know really what happened 
And uh, some people say, oh, well, you've heard the, the, the voice of the Lord. I don't know what it was, but somewhere in my mind, this, um, this idea popped up. And this idea said, well, that was your part of the agreement. I never agreed on that. And you can, you can tell me, well, that was the voice of God or what, whatsoever. But for me, it was like, oh, okay. So the next thing I did, I said, okay, if you really want to change me, you better make sure that you do it 100%. I mean, who am I to talk like that to the creator of the world, right? But I did. And he dealt with it. And he, he didn't mind. He, he started to change me. And I think it was almost a year later, the 1st of October in 1995, I got baptized. And after that, I met my wife. And we married and my life was totally changed I didn't feel like going after all the different women again I didn't feel like drinking too much beer I I felt compassionate about other people um, I felt felt compassionate about I still do about people who never heard about the gospel and I started to evangelize I started to support missionaries and stuff like that and um, in, in, after a while, my wife and I wanted to do some mission work as well. So we decided to, uh, to travel down to China and to, to bring in Bibles. So in some parts of China, it was forbidden to, to have Bibles or other biblical literature. And um, we decided to, to visit China um, with an organization called Open Doors. It's... Uh, originated in in Holland um, you might know the, the the guy who started that in English they call him brother Andrew in Dutch it's Anna van der Beil anyway we went there and we brought in Bibles we brought in uh, uh, sound files uh, still on tapes in that time uh, with Bible studies and this one moment there was this small Chinese guy and he he just took all the Bibles and he those Chinese people, they don't look, look in your, into your eyes. But this one moment when he grabbed the last suit, suitcase with Bibles, he looked into my eyes and I saw some, something I've, I, I've never managed to forget. And I don't want to forget it. He, he had this happiness in his, his eyes for just <coughs> receiving God's word. And here I am in Holland or wherever. And you're going to the shop and you can buy all sorts of Bibles all sorts of colors, translations. And this guy was risking all to receive Bibles and to, to bring them to his brothers and sisters all across the province. So for my wife and I, this was the starting point of w wanting to do mission ourselves. So after a few years, my wife started a, a practice as a, um, as a lawyer. Uh, we had a, a great income. We had already, um, I think three children by then I've studied uh, five years on a Bible school and but things were going normal again and I I, I went to we went to a, um, a birthday party of a friend and I heard my wife say I this was the only phrase I heard she said well I would like to go into mission but I think um, Jurgen doesn't really want to so on the way back I said what do you mean Jurgen doesn't want to she said well we've got two cars we've got a nice house for Dutch standards, a big house, we've got some children, it's like, it's lovely, right? And I said, but if this is all there is, if this is what we, if this uh, is the thing we live for, it's not much, is it? So from that moment on, we started to orientate on mission. We've moved to England for a year. There I've studied theology at the university. Um, and after a year, we went back to Holland where I finished the, the study. We, all, we did this, by the way, all mostly on our savings. We, we already had some supporters who supported us every month, but we saved so much money that we could do that for uh, at least two or three years. Anyway, um, and then we started to, to, to look for a good mission organization, and we ended up um, uh, at uh, Mi Africa Inland Mission, a uh, AIM. And together with the mission organization, we uh, found a country, Madagascar, where still a lot of people are, um, 
unknowing about the gospel. And so in November 2015, we've moved to Madagascar and we um, uh, we started to live in the, the capital, uh, Antananarivo, where we studied the official language and also did some explanation, some surveys to find out where, where we could live. And we came up um, with this area where you have a group of people called the Antanala. And this group is basically unreached. They don't speak the official language. Uh, they can't read, they can't write, and they can't, they only, they only understand their own dialect. So when we came there, we, we did speak the official language, but they didn't understand us. And they told us that there were, because we had some translators with us, and they told us there are evangelists coming in and out the area, but they preach in the official language in the King James Version of the Malagasy Bible, and they just didn't understand a word of it. But they knew, and they said that the news must be really good because people become so happy when they start to believe the gospel. So they really said, okay, if you if you are really serious and you want to live among us, you're most welcome, but you have to come quickly. So we did. We moved into that area. It's a very hard to reach area. If it's rainy, it's almost impossible. And we've got a, I mean, I've got a big four before. It's a Nissan Patrol uh, 4.2. It's a strong one. But if, if it's rainy, it's even with this car, it's almost impossible. And we started to translate Bible stories in the Antanala language, in the dialect, which is brilliant because now I, I had this equipment, I, I, I had this material and I could go to the, the, the villages and I started to just to, to tell the stories of the Bible from Genesis till Revelation in, in the Antanala language. And finally, the people managed to understand the story of the Bible, the the. The, the story of salvation, and they were astonished. And I mostly have contact with kings of the area, which is very strategic because they 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 are the ones who have to teach the the people. And several of these teachers um, are already they they already uh, teachers uh, kings. I mean, they already decided to follow Jesus, but they also know it's very hard to to stop doing what they were used to. Do, uh, uh, doing yeah what they used to do mainly teaching the people the way of the ancestors because the the people where we live they firmly believe in the spiritual world and in the ancestors and if they don't please the ancestors um, they can become for example really sick or even uh, see their crops um, uh, be damaged or destroyed because the ancestors are very powerful so they they live in this fear of always needing to please the ancestors, and now they ha they've got the the gospel of the of the the wonderful news of Jesus, uh, the the one who died and rose again on the third day, who is stronger than death, who is stronger than the ancestors. And so, on the one hand, they want to accept Jesus because he is he's strong, uh, he's um, he's powerful, he's God. On the other hand, they are too afraid to, to let go of the, the, the spirits because they are, are afraid that the spirits will come and punish them for their decision. So this is the balance uh, they're in. And the kings need to find out how they deal with that. And, well, we already wanted to return to Madagascar in July, but because of the whole corona thingy, it's not a thingy, but the whole corona uh, situation, um, we couldn't return. I wanted to return because I'm I'm not afraid. Some people in our area messaged me uh, on um, on internet. Some of them have internet, and they said, "Are you afraid to come back?" And I I'm always the one who tells them, "If you're a Christian, you don't have to be afraid because Christ is bigger than whatever." So I ne I needed to tell them, "No, it's not because I don't." want to come back, it's not because I'm afraid, but it's because the government doesn't allow us to go back. And for them it's like, oh, all right, the government, yeah, we know how things go, go with the, the government. So that, that was not really a problem, but hopefully, hopefully, and please pray for us that hopefully we can return soon. My American friends already were already able to, to return because America doesn't have a second wave, right? That's what they say. And Madagascar is like, okay, you don't have a second wave. You're welcome. But in Holland, it's like, oh, no, oh, no. 
the, the hospitals are overflowing with COVID patients and, and, and second wave, but panic, panic. So, yeah, please pray for us. Uh, we really want to go back. I mean, my home is there. Um, my friends are there. Um, and the people over there need Christ. They need uh, salvation. They need the happiness we in the West are um, have, uh, have access to so easily. So, this was about my story. Uh, please tell me in, uh, in the comments what you think about it. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up. Um, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, which I would appreciate very much. You can also follow me on Odyssey. Uh, you will find both links in the description of the video. And um, I'll see you next time.